Pablo, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. Let everybody know who you are and what you're about. Thank you uh, for the invite, Andy. This is very exciting. I've been following your podcast for, for a long time. Um, I think it's a very fresh idea what you have. Uh, who am I? Um, my name is, uh, as we said, initially Pablo Ortiz Monasterio. I started out in security 22 years ago doing personal security, crisis management, uh, you know, when things really, really go wrong in, in Mexico, where, is, where I'm from. Usually, you need somebody to walk you through the process. And uh, so I've been involved in many, many, and anything from kidnap for ransom, extortions, uh, things like that, right? Uh, in 2004, I decided that was not me. And I decided to shift a little bit my focus towards prevention instead of reaction. Reaction is very, it, it takes a little, it, it like it drains your energy. It's like a vampire, right? And, uh, and it's very hard to react when things go wrong. There's only so many things you can do. So I shifted towards prevention. And 12 years ago, we created a company that does training, mostly driving. Our specialty is driving, but we do a lot of uh, situational awareness. We do a lot of um, uh, situational It's uh, the, the situational debriefings for the family, mm -hmm. kind of like uh, uh, self-protection type of uh, type of uh, training for families and expats that come to Mexico to leave. But our focus has been on prevention, mostly on vehicles, because the most dangerous part, or, or in the, this is due to statistics, statistically, the, the most dangerous place you can be at any given time is a vehicle that is not moving. And that is where most of the major attacks and the major crimes have been committed is in a vehicle that is not moving for some reason, right? There's many, there's many situations. So that's why we focused on that. And then, of course, we focused on the science and then we learned that our job is to manage, uh, to, to manage risk. And when you have accidents being, having 26,000 people die in the U.S. every year due to, well, due to, there's several figures, right? But between 26,000 and 30,000 people die every year in the U.S. due to accidents and very, very little die because of an attack on a vehicle. So we kind of like, we, we migrated into saving lives. So most of what we do now in training has to do with accident avoidance, right? And prevention techniques. Okay. And that we'll get into a, a lot of that as we go on, but I'm curious, you know, you said uh, your your former career was kind of draining you like a vampire, and I'm sure you had tons of other skills that you could uh, have used. But why did you choose driver training? Why was this something that you felt like was was for you? Well, because at the time there was, uh, I thought it was the most fun I did in security, that and shooting, and I mean you talked to Gonzalo, and and uh, so. Shooting is very difficult in Mexico because there's a lot of regulations and the laws right. don't allow people to have guns. And uh, and driving was the other thing that was fun. And I wanted to do something that was fun. And on the other hand, there was a couple of providers of driver training in Mexico at the time. But when I went there, in my opinion, they had no idea what they were doing. Kind of like they just went to a course somewhere in the U.S. or in Europe. And then they decided they were instructors just by going to a course. It's kind of like, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of like living in a cave for 20 years and then thinking you're a geologist just because of that. Right. And yeah. uh, so nothing really made sense of what they were doing uh, in Mexico. And I wanted to and they were doing it in old parking lots, no restrooms. You know, very wealthy families were taking these courses, and uh, I, I thought that, that there was a big opportunity there to create something that was world class uh, and that was, you know, the best of the best. And well, we've we've proven that concept that now we're, you know, growing. We we've opened that same office in the U.S. and we're, you know, gaining traction very fast because of the same thing. Very cool. So. Uh, you, you touched on this a minute ago, but like who comes to your classes? Obviously, I think probably law enforcement, executive protection, but to like the average family, like drivers like me, would somebody like me show up to one of your classes? Absolutely. Well, we have we have several types of, of training, right? Because different people need different types of uh, of, uh, of knowledge or, or skills. If you're a security driver, you know, bodyguard or, uh, you know, protection agent, law enforcement you need a certain type of skills because your job demands those type of skills. But if you're if you're a regular person that you drive yourself, you still need some of those skills. Maybe not as because you do other things for a living. You're you're not in the car all the time, but you do need a little bit of those skills because 
how can I teach you control if you've never felt what out of control feels like? Right. And that is yeah. kind of thing. So we do a lot of training for, you know, professional drivers, but at least in Mexico, at least 50% probably of our courses have to do with non security oriented people kind of like, you know, executives from, from companies. We do a lot of, uh, training for companies for their executives and their families and their kids and most of that has to do with you know a little bit about security prevention and, and, and crime prevention and a lot about our accident avoidance right and we do that in the states as well lots of families that you know the, the they even if they have drivers and bodyguards and regardless of how much money they have they want to drive themselves so they have sports cars and they have this kind of vehicles and they want to drive themselves so of course it makes sense to teach them to drive right and to teach them how to actually feel what it feels like to lose control of a vehicle. Right. I, I like that point. You, you don't know how you're going to respond if you haven't felt it before. So that seems like putting people in an uncomfortable situation and bringing them through that is a big part of your training, right? Absolutely. It's Think of it as putting you in the worst possible situation you can be in a vehicle, but in a controlled environment where we know and we can calculate the outcome. And that's the other thing. We, we're members of the Society for Auto Automotive Engineers where we work very closely with different agencies and companies uh, that with technical development to try to understand the vehicle, how the ADAS works, how the vehicle dynamics, how the physics, how everything works in the vehicle. And what we do is we, we're going to expose you to these types of situations so that you can understand the sequence of decisions that that got you to losing control of the vehicle, how it feels like. And then we're going to teach you by repetition. What mm -hmm. are the sequence of actions that you need to take to get that vehicle back into control? So first of all, you're going to start feeling, and uh, I've been told not to say uh, muscle memory because your muscles have no memory, right? Right, but right. At the, end, at the end of the day, it's the same thing. It's we make this mechanical process, biomechanical process, automatic so that you start feeling in your body when, you're, when your vehicle is starting or is approaching that limit and you know what's going to happen afterwards. And that's the big difference between somebody that has experienced this and somebody that has. You know what's going to happen afterwards. If you haven't experienced it, everything is a surprise. And your right. brain is very, very slow, right? Because and we're not going to get into that, but you have two brains. You have your automatic brain, system one, downstairs brain, and then you have your system two, the book is uh, Thinking Fast and Slow with Daniel Kahneman. Yes. Extraordinary book. Yes. Yeah. But um, your system one, if it knows what's going on, if the heuristic is there, it's simple because it's going to react accordingly. But if it's not, then it's going to rely on your on your secondary brain, on your, on your upper brain, which is very, very slow, to tell it what's going on, right? And while you're analyzing all that, this is happening in fractions of a second. It's too, your brain is too slow. And everything's going to come up as a surprise. You're going to be reacting to everything. And everything that happens in a vehicle is counterintuitive because mm. our human beings have a tendency or, or our brains are designed to think in a linear way, right? right. You, you're you driving at 20 miles an hour and it takes you 30 feet to break. And it's an example. It might, might not even be that, right? But it takes you 30 feet to, to get to a complete stop. You double that speed. Your brain's going to think you're going to double the distance of speed, but it goes times four. Oh, okay. In everything you do is exponential on the vehicle, right? Got it. So okay. very, very, very little increments in speed make a very big difference in what's going to happen with the vehicle and how the vehicle is going to react when you give it an input. So what we do in this, in this type of courses, and this is for people like you that you're, you're not in, uh, in, you know, you're not a professional driver. You don't, your mm -hmm. job doesn't rely on that. What we're going to do is we're going to teach you that so that your brain understands how that exponential uh, function and how the force is being applied to the vehicle feel like and what's going to happen next when you try to input something to the vehicle so that you can anticipate those, those, uh, those consequences or those, those reactions and actually make decisions based on that, right? Yeah, that, that, is, that is absolutely fascinating. And it also sounds, uh, like you said, like this is fun. <laughs> this, is, is. Uh, this is what you enjoy doing. So let me ask, so... If I think that I'm a good driver, do I really need to train better? If I've never been in an accident, I've never gotten a speeding ticket, do I actually like really need to do this? That, that's a great question because here's the thing. Everybody thinks they're a good driver. This is human nature. Everybody, not only that, everybody thinks they're a better driver than most people out there. 
Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, unless you run, I mean, you run into Dale Eckhart Jr. in the in the street or uh, you know someone like that. Yeah. You pretty I much think that you're a better driver than everyone else, right? Mm-hmm. And everybody around you is making stupid decisions most of the time. I think it was uh, George Carlin, the comedian, that said, uh, "It's very simple. Whoever's going faster than me is crazy. Whoever uh, is going slower than me is an imbecile." I am the point of reference. <laughs> and, right. And it works like that, right? Very. I've, I've never met anyone that honestly thinks they're a bad driver. Some mm-hmm. people are don't have as much confidence to drive, but they don't really think they're a bad driver. And the fact that you know the rules of the road and you, the fact that you know the basics of the vehicle does not mean that you're not gonna that, that you're not gonna face a situation where your your knowledge is gonna be limited, and that you're gonna be making guessing your way out of that situation. And most reactions are you close your eyes, you turn your your arms, you you reach for the brake and then nothing happens because if your tires are skidding, there's no brake. And um, there's there's a statistic actually in the Society for Automotive Engineers about how you know the normal average driver will be comfortable. The, the comfort zone is around 40% of the vehicle's capability. And this is this is in, in terms of lateral acceleration. Because you can be, I mean you can be Fittipaldi driving 100 miles an hour in a straight line. The problem is when you try to turn. Yeah. That is where it gets interesting, right? Because then you're applying forces to the vehicle. And uh, most people might be might stay within that 40% of the vehicle's capability throughout their lives and never never exceed that. So that you never get a ticket. You never had an insurance uh, claim mm-hmm. or anything. The problem is you're coming out of an intersection and then something does something stupid and you're forced to react. And the problem is you get you don't have to go 100 miles an hour to get over that 40%. You can be driving at 30 miles an hour and you're going to reach 80%, 90% really quickly. Because you're trying to react and you're you're forcing the vehicle to do things that you don't usually do. And if you don't know what's going to come out of that, what, what the outcome is going to be, your decisions might not be in the right place, right? You might end up, you know, getting yourself more into the problem than if you did know what you needed to do. Right. And that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, I follow you guys on Instagram and I suggest that everybody uh, follow along with me. Um, and you shared this one video. There was a car. It looked like it was an American intersection. It was trying to turn left. It had waited for the light to turn red because traffic hadn't stopped. So it goes to turn left. Well, somebody runs the light, but they ran the light at a pretty slow speed to where it looked like if you're looking at this on your phone, people would have had plenty of time to stop or to get out of the way. But it sounds like from what you just said, you've got a whole lot of mental factors and also physical factors to overcome in something that looks like a pretty avoidable situation, right? Well, that that involves a lot of things, right? The first is situational awareness. People are not actually aware. And I mean, you've talked to, to Greg Williams, that's how we met, and uh, Brian Marin. But uh, so first is how long is it going to take you to actually realize that the situation is getting out of control. There's something unexpected in the in the environment. And that takes time. And the one thing you have to understand when driving is driving is time and distance, is managing time and distance all the time. Everything you do takes time. And when it takes time, it takes distance. And so you understand 100 miles an hour is 127, 127 feet per second. Right. So how many things can you feed into a second? That's very hard to to actually, your brain doesn't work very well with seconds, right? So how many things can you feed into a second? Well, that's that's very relative. But how many things can you feed into 127 feet? That's a lot of things, right? <laughs> and that is happening every second. If you're going 100 miles an hour. If you look down to look at the radio to change the station, that is 127 feet. 127 feet. Whatever you do on the vehicle is going to translate into distance. So if it took you a second to actually see that vehicle come by and you're doing 50 miles an hour, so that's you know roughly 55 feet that you're going to be traveling before you actually realize he's there. And then comes the other problem, your brain. Your brain is trained to do certain things a certain way because that's how intuition works and you've never trained something, you've never done something before, it's very hard to actually do something different and it's, it's going to immediately turn to look at the vehicle. Why? Because you don't want to hit it. But the problem is the rule is if you look at it, you hit it. Mm. It's like shooting. If you look at it, mm. you hit it. It's the same thing here. If you look at that vehicle, your brain is going to unconsciously point the, the vehicle towards that. 
So unless okay. you train, and this is when I say it's counterintuitive because telling right. your brain where to look on a moment of crisis, and then if you look at uh, uh, Colonel Lieutenant Colonel uh, Dave Grossman's book on combat, and he talks about how your brain reacts when it's under stress and you know making all these decisions in a time, you have to force your brain, or to force your eyes to look towards where you want to go. That means you have to scan the environment to look for the way out and then find a way out and then either break and steer or accelerate and steer towards where you want to go, which is out of the X, wherever that vehicle is not going to be. And you have to analyze that. But the problem is by the time you realize, and look, it took us at least a minute for me to explain all that to you. So if it takes a second, you're going to be 20, 30 feet in front of where you were when you started thinking. And most of the times that other vehicle will be in your path because you didn't react in time. And it's got to do with reaction times. On average, the reaction time, the, the brain, or the mental reaction time, and this is a, a paper that was published by Mark Green, PhD, for the Society of Automotive Engineers. And he, he says, on average, uh, human beings, the mental process, which is something appears in my peripheral vision, this car is starting to get into my peripheral vision, then my brain, of course, orders the eyes to look at this vehicle to see what it is, realize the situation, it analyzes the situation, what's going on, looks for options, makes a decision, and then sends the order to your hands to turn and to your leg to brake, you know, step off of the accelerator and brake. On average, on a normal human being, if, if you're expecting it, if you're at the track and I tell you it's gonna happen, it's gonna take 0.7 seconds. Mm. If you're not expecting it, it's gonna go double that roughly. I mean, we've we've measured that it's about 1.2 seconds to 1.4 seconds. If, as I said, if you're traveling at 50 miles an hour, that's gonna be 63 feet that you're going to travel before you even release the accelerator and start turning. So if you add situational awareness and that, so why does it happen? Mostly because we are too slow to react. And another thing is we're not looking far ahead or far enough ahead to make these decisions. And, and when you're when you're managing time and distance, and, and please interrupt me if I'm not making any sense because it might get no, a little technical. Not, but, uh, I like all of this. This is great. All right. So when you're managing time and distance, when you're looking, you're looking into the future, right? Literally, because whatever you're looking at in front of you is going to be where you are or you're going to be where that is. In, in, in a few seconds. So if you're only looking a second ahead, you have one second to make decisions in your life. If you have two seconds, which is the minimum, the bare minimum, is you should be looking ahead and you should, you should leave yourself enough room for two seconds of reaction time of whatever. That, that gives you plenty of time to analyze situation and, and do whatever you need to do. How do you do that? If you're traveling in the freeway, find a mark and mm -hmm. look at the car in front of you and the moment that car passes that mark, count two seconds until until you pass that mark. That will give you – so it's not a definite amount of distance. It's a different amount of time because time mm -hmm. is, what, is what matters here. And so if you give yourself enough time and you're looking into the future with enough uh, – with, you know, far, far enough, you will be able to realize the situation is there and make the decision accordingly. If you're not going very fast, it's going to be easy. If you're going fast, you it's – it's always better if you've done it before and your brain does it automatically so that you can get out of the situation without getting into another secondary crisis that might end up, you know, getting you into an accident or something that could have been avoided either way. Right. You know, um, and thinking about all the stuff that the brain does, uh, last summer I was in a, a car accident. Uh, a really nice young lady ended up uh, turning left in front of me and she didn't see me coming and I hit her pretty hard. Um, had very little time to react. And as I was trying to remember what was happening, I saw that everything was just kind of mentally in flashes. Like it was almost like it was a, a PowerPoint presentation. Like I don't see any motion. I don't see anything. And it makes me think now that I'm talking to you that how fast my brain was processing. I'm not also remembering a lot of stuff because my brain is so worried about keeping me safe in the moment that I'm not necessarily making memories. Is that sound like does that sounds somewhat yes. smart? I don't know. I, yes. There, there is a very good theory. Actually, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Grossman explains it very well in his book, although the it's based on the U S army, U S army research Institute for the social and behavioral sciences, I believe. But, uh, no, actually, I think no, I, I don't, I don't know what the source is for that for this, but it's, it's okay. in his book and it's really good. It, it explains about how, 
when you when when you are under stress, and this is fear-induced stress, your brain will go from condition white to yellow to red, and it's not Cooper's color code. It's based on the same idea, but it's not Cooper's color code. Then it goes into a gray area, and then it goes further up. Red condition is when your heartbeat starts to accelerate. Your brain is going to start, you know, sending all the resources it needs for the fight or flight and to to make you operationally. It will give you, you will be at your highest state of cognitive and physical ability at that particular moment. And that is when you see things in slow motion. Right. right? And it's very right. interesting. Yeah. When, when, when people relate. But the problem is when you go above condition red, this condition gray that really no one knows how it works, your brain's going to start shutting down some things because it's going to start to prepare itself for you know, life or death survival, fight or flight kind of thing. And it's going to, a lot of people, there's a lot of uh, soldiers in combat that report knowing that the weapons were firing because they saw the flash of the inner muscle, but they couldn't hear it because they were starting to lose, the, you lose your hearing, you lose your smell, taste, things that are secondary senses to survival. It's going to start, you're going to start having a lot of basic constriction. People start shaking, whether they even even if one if they don't want to, they start shaking because of the mass constriction that is going out. And one of the the, things in the mind that takes a lot of energy and that takes a lot of resources is the anterograde memory, which is like mm -hmm. the short-term memory. So your, your brain might be shutting down some of those systems because you're approaching condition black. Condition black is where the stress is so big that mm -hmm. your brain completely shuts down from the top down. And that's where when people lose control of their sphincters and things like that. And there's all, all kinds of things that can happen in that process because your brain is actually redirecting resources towards surviving yeah yeah so, that, yeah. so that's that why people sense. don't that make, yeah you know i'm just i hadn't really thought about that but hearing you talk i was like okay well maybe this is what's going on so I, i'm glad that you were uh, able to be my psychotherapist and uh, help me through that <laughs> pablo thank you um so in your opinion you, you, you've kind of hinted at this just a little bit what do you think the most dangerous thing that we can experience while driving is what's what's the most dangerous thing that we could experience well i think the most dangerous thing uh you know normal driver even experienced driver can can experience is loss of control and that is under an oversteering when when understeering there's two, the two conditions that can actually happen to the vehicle understeering is when your vehicle is turning less that means you get to the corner you turn and the vehicle keeps on going straight you end up you end up doing that very wide turn and that has happened to everyone most vehicles are designed to understeer because that's easy to correct how do you mm. correct it just release the pedal bring the speed down so that your tires can grip again but then there's oversteering and that is a lot more dangerous it happens more if you have a rear wheel a rear wheel drive car and, but it can happen to any car. And that is when you lose control, you lose grip on your rear tires, the tires on the back of the vehicle. And those tires are going to start going faster than your rear tires, meaning you're, you're going to start facing the other way. And that is very, very difficult to, to control. Once you get past a certain degree of skidding or of sliding, it's impossible to recoup. And that is one of the places, or that's one of the situations where most people get into accidents. And you see all hundreds of vehicles that they, they post on, on social media with these muscle cars that they, they over accelerate. And then you see them, how they go like this and they, mm -hmm. they start skidding a little bit and they lose control. And they end up in the fence. It has to do with first, they've never experienced that before. Maybe if you've experienced it before and you've experienced it and, and doing delivered practice, you might be able to recognize the situation and, and help it corrected before it happens and there's actually uh, a company that create that produces uh, it's called easy drift they create this this plastic covers for the rear tires that will force that oversteer on very on, on at slow speeds so that it will teach your your system one your amygdala your 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 you know lower brain how it feels and how you can correct it and it's amazing what they do we uh, we are actually working with them now um, you know, to get people to experience and to, and to understand how that feels. But I think that is because we, we might think that the most dangerous situation might be when you're in, in an attack or you're in the middle of a riot and you need to find a place to go and there's nowhere to go. But the probability of something like that is a lot smaller than being in a situation where, because think about going driving down the freeway, uh, the roads in the U.S. are, are, and, I don't know how to put it and not be offensive, but they're boring. 
<laughs> right? Okay, I'll, I'll there, agree to that. There, I'll agree to that. There, there are, there are not. There's nothing there. It's only straight line, and everybody's going the same speed. It's only a straight line, and I mean, I know it's more efficient than anything else in the world, but also it tends to lead. It leads to people losing attention and, and focusing on other things because our brain doesn't like to be idle. Our brain likes to be entertained. And when you're driving, when there's nothing going on, I remember I drove from uh, from Dallas to San Diego. Well, I've driven from, I've, I've driven all over the US, but I I've, I've drove from Dallas to San Diego that one time. And there's a part where you're going through Arizona and uh, I mean, you're going, everybody's going the same speed and there's nothing. There's not a single mountain or a tree, nothing. It's just flat land for hours. And, you know, your brain starts to wander and go somewhere else. And that creates a distraction. And when it creates a distraction, the problem is if something happens. You have to react. You have very little time because when you were distracted, coming back to reality takes time and time takes distance, right? So you try to react and you get into that situation where you oversteer. Most people will get will not be able to control that because that vehicle went over 40% of their car's capability really fast. And that is probably the worst situation uh, somebody can experience. And if, wow. you, if you're if you thinking, just just to, because on the side of security, people are also scared about, I mean, what are you going to do if they're going to rob you or something, right? But you're, if you're trying to run away from a situation where they're chasing you to, 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 do, to do some harm or from a dangerous situation, and you don't know what you're doing, you're going to end up creating an under an, or an oversteer, and you're going to get into an accident. And then you have the, the worst of both worlds, right? You got into an accident, you might be hurt, but then those guys are going to catch up to you and still do whatever they wanted to do. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, I think there's a video, you've probably seen it by now, of a robbery in New York in broad daylight where a RAV4 is getting hit by a Mercedes Benz. And uh, yeah, that's amazing. I'm like, good Lord, what? You know, it looks like, like a scene out of a movie. I actually thought the guy in the RAV4 did pretty well considering what was going on. I think he was just on his way to the bank. But yeah, um, I really, I, I, I totally get about what you're saying. It's about managing time and distance and the time equals distance and that I should probably slow down while I'm driving. Uh, I think that's probably what, uh, what I should probably do. So tell me about a story where you use some of your driving skills to keep yourself safe. Well, there's a couple, but uh, we were driving from uh, from Puebla in Mexico towards Mexico City, and there's uh, this very um, there's well, we we're, it's a, it's a major freeway, but then we get diverted and we use like a like a like a minor freeway that goes around the, the sea, so you don't have to go through the city. And these vehicles started chasing us, and they wanted to uh, they wanted to get ahead of us to close to you know to to create a barricade and not let us through. And they were very very aggressive, and um, so we had to drive like that for about twenty minutes at high speeds until finally the car behind us got into an accident and crashed. So mm. it was probably the one uh, that. Actually, my skills proved me. It proved that I was a better driver than the other guy. He had a similar car, and he actually got into that uh, to get in, into an accident, not knowing how to react. And uh, but the most dangerous, probably in terms of what I just told you in, in the last question, is I was driving in the same freeway, uh, but on the, on the major freeway from Puebla, Mexico, and I got into a puddle that I didn't see because it was like right coming out of a corner. There was a big puddle, a big river that was crossing the freeway and I completely lost control of the vehicle. And I managed to, I, I managed to keep control of the vehicle and I barely scratched it against the security wall. But that was probably the most, the scariest moment of my life because I thought Ooh. it was going to, I was going fast. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I bet. And Gosh. So uh, I've asked you a similar question before. Uh, so I want to kind of see if your answer has changed. What's the most favorite car that you have ever driven? Well, I remember that question, but the most, my favorite car that I've ever had in my life and that I had the most fun with, and it's got to do with a lot of things, was a uh, Maserati Gran Turismo. And uh, it, that, was a, that was a fantastic car. That car was so much fun. It has so much grip. It was and it was very sturdy. It was it was a 2008 uh, Maserati Gran Turismo. But going around the track, the most fun I've ever driven that I that was not mine probably. And that's why it was so much fun. It was uh, Ferrari 458 Italia. <laughs> yeah, you're just like oh yeah Maserati Ferrari. It's like this is nothing. Like man, I drive a Kia. 
So, like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, in Mexico, on a day to day, I, I drive a Volkswagen Jetta, which is a fantastic car, and I love mm-hmm. it. And we use those for training in Mexico, right? Um, but you're talking about fun. If we, as you know, since we've been doing this, we were we were offered to buy a racing championship in Mexico because we wanted to have access to the Formula One racetrack here to do our training, and to do that, you need to. Well, we needed to become better clients. We needed to become, mm-hmm. you know. And you, more, we, we needed to, to have something to offer. And uh, so we ended up buying that uh, racing championship, which I don't run, but I enjoy very much. But having access to the, to the track means that a lot of people that own this very nice cars, very uh, beautiful cars, they, they approach us and say, hey, would you mind driving my car with me in the, in the passenger seat to, you know, to actually feel what the vehicle can do? So we've gotten the opportunity to drive quite you know, a few different cars and that is that is my favorite car. Maybe not the fastest. Maybe not the, the, the you know the the one with the most grip or the most efficient. But that was the one with the most fun, where you think you're gonna die at the end of every straight, but the car actually pulls through. So it's uh-huh. that's, exciting. That's all right. I mean, you know what, man? It sounds like you just have an absolute fun life where you have found what you were called to do and you were enjoying every second of it, man. That is awesome. So, Pablo, tell everybody where they can find you and your driving school online. Uh, best way is online uh, social media is usually AS3 driving uh, and Instagram or AS3 International on Facebook. And our, um, our, our website is as3driving.com. Simple. 